And we are truly a reflection of society. We've got fat and skinny, old and young, rich and poor, dumb and smart. There is no literacy test to us for Congress. We, <laughs> we are kind of a reflection of you, you know? I, I don't know if you got a good old boy yeah, to talk down there. Yeah, we do. A big one. And you're talking about secret organizations. That is a secret organization. Yeah, sure. And they run the county. Take your car to the muffler shop. They put on a muffler. You don't pay for the muffler. You don't get the car back. Well, if you feed somebody's horses, and you don't pay for the feed, you don't get the horse back. That's called an adjuster's lien until you pay for and it. I said, Sergeant, my name's Jim Shockley. I think he probably knew who I was. And he says, uh, I got an adjuster's lien on these horses. And uh, you know, the lady owes 3,000 some bucks. Unless you got the money, you can't have the horses. And this is a quote, I think word for word. We're taking the horses. And if you get in the way, we're taking care of you. Now, if that officer would say that to a white male whose family's been here over 100 years, chairman of the House Judiciary, if he's going to say that to me, what is he going to say to some Mexican hitchhiker? Y you know what I mean? I mean, I'm the last guy in the world he wants to screw with. Well, he didn't get the horses, but called the county attorney. He says, hey, Jim, you got a adjuster. Says, I know that. Tell the deputy. <laughs> Grandparents I wish I'd had. I think maybe being honest is where we went wrong. We seem to have run into a situation that uh, has affected a lot of other people too. As we learned later, we just happened to wind up on the forefront of the fight. It was really uh, strange, very strange. I testified at the trial. What happened with you, Virginia? Well, I was leaving the animal shelter one Saturday morning, having served my volunteer shift, and I found a watch in the parking lot. And that was the beginning of years of problems. And you did call the sheriff's department? Oh, and I called the sheriff's department. To ask if anybody had, had reported a lost or stolen watch, and they hadn't. And something was wrong with the winding stem, so I took it to a local jeweler. And the watchmaker said, I recognize that. That belongs to Mrs. Seed, I think. And asked me, where did you get this watch? It was stolen. And he would have the lady call me who owned it, but she never called. And about three weeks, a sheriff's deputy called. He said, I understand you have um, Linda Seed's watch and I'll come by and pick it up. And I said, no, you won't. Not until you've Proof proven who it goes to. We called us a felon right on that first conversation, which really got my back up. Right after the phone calls, they started cruising the house. My daughter-in-law said, have Jim Shockley look up the finder's law. Said it varies from state to state. In some states, it, it finders are keepers. You know, I kept waiting for somebody to come to their senses uh, down the courthouse and, and, and quit the harassment and the intimidation. Once the police get down this path that uh, we're the police and we've been embarrassed, it's, it's pretty hard for cops to ever back off. They, it's not in their nature. Later that year, we started getting uh, correspondence from the county attorney. Uh, he took the he took their the position that we were felons. The sheriff has to back up his officer. Okay, once the sheriff backs up the officer, county attorney has got to back up the sheriff. So I call the county attorney and uh, the county attorney George Coyne, and uh, he says, uh, "Now uh, we want the watch back." I says, "Well." You know, uh, she wants an apology. And he says, no, you know, we're going to charge her. And uh, I says, that's not really smart. And shortly after that, they delivered a summons for us, and we wound up going to court. We were just trying to make sure that things were done correctly and that the watch went to the rightful owner. Uh, so instead of that happening, Virginia went to jail. <laughs> I turned myself in. I mean, they spent tens of thousands of dollars 
prosecuting and persecuting me. The whole justice system was involved. They even saw outside advice when Judge Langton threw out the case. They went to people and paid people in other parts of the state to write opinions. Mr. Cohen said, oh, well, that was just covered in their general budget. So money was no expense. The reason, real reason we brought the suit was that we wanted to make people aware of what was going on. The county cruised our house, harassed us, intimidated us, and never once got in the car, went over and got the woman and brought her by the house. It never occurred to them to do something simple like that. I think she made her point, and she still got the watch. Nobody ever apologized. And, they, and Mr. Reardon was going to, if he'd had his way, would have sent her to jail for 10 years, state prison, t- plus six months. Plus six a little months. extra thrown in. An enhanced penalty because it was so heinous. <laughs> That's just bizarre. <laughs> so after he cost, essentially contributed to the cost to the county for all of this, He's uh, given the job of city judge of Hamilton. I'm still madder than hell. Um, and, uh, and the urge to kill never goes away. Um, <laughs> but it has more or less soured us on... We're very careful. ...in the valley, and uh, I don't like dealing with this class of people. And I certainly don't like being under their jurisdiction. Nothing scares the people you're dealing with down there or up here. Nothing scares them more than possibly being thrown out of office. That's the most frightening thing to a, a lousy politician that, that there is. is. You have to have all of your ducks in a row and all the evidence nailed down to go all the way with it and win in court before you ever file that affidavit and that petition. Hey, Push hey. the hot buttons on any of these issues by simply having your speaker, Sheriff Richard Mack, is the guy that beat the Brady Bill, for crying out loud. He's got a reputation of pro-American, pro-Constitution, pro-freedom, pro-liberty. What about when he gets up and the subject of his talk is the county sheriff, America's last line of defense, or the constitutional duties of a sheriff? Just saturate this area with the right kind of thoughts. The rule of law rather than the rule of men. What do you think the biggest problem of Hamilton is? Distrust, uh, distrust of the local government. The problem we have is that Max Baucus and George Corn, our county attorney, are best friends. Yeah. And they've been there best friends know. for 20 years. That's right. I don't know that he is that close to Baucus, but he's certainly a Baucus supporter because he'll support just about any Democrat. Politicians are only good as their credibility. And if you believe us, you'll kind of go with us. And if you don't, you won't. I remember seeing some criticism that George was not taking a payoff from Bacchus. I would have thought that would have been different, something more somebody might say, although he isn't that I'm aware of, but that he must be paying off Bacchus because he drove an old car, and that's how he, even though he makes supposedly so much money. No, I, I'm only throwing this out for humor, but it was like, but he w- was making money but driving this old car because he's too busy paying off Bacchus. And, and my first thought was I laughed at him because he had a car like my son, and I said, Geez, George, I didn't realize that's why. But uh, uh, but to this day, I, why would you? What would he gain from paying him off? I don't know. So a lot of what we see government doing is being done because nobody's watching at some uh, meaningful level. One of the problems of being a rural state, your county attorney has supreme power. Can almost to the point of being able to make laws and certainly doesn't have to abide by them and there's no higher authority to correct it. We need to become a little bit more aware and educated about the facts and styles of government that um, arise out of the people who get put there. You could take things to the state attorney general against the current county attorney but you weren't going to get anywhere. It's only us who are responsible for the manner of government that we sanction. There are 
individuals who have been in office for many, many years, and they build up their own uh, uh, way of doing things. They can develop uh, their own little uh, sort of fiefdom within the total picture. Acknowledge the fact that special interest has weaseled its way into the styles of government at all levels. The fiefdoms can operate independently and they can go out and with their cronies and with their friends and they can develop things that you, that you can see but uh, you have no control over. Maybe, uh, maybe no government's better than bad government, I don't know. We waited for years for just the baseline map. What is this valley? And then we could have planned. We could not do it because Betty Lund, as a, as a clerk of the court, claimed it was her right to own that information and sell it. This clerk and recorder controlled this valley through her job. There's an example of, of uh, deeds that were turned over in one day and turned into joint ownership with somebody sitting in Betty Lund's office signing them and the George Corn approved it. It goes to George Corn. We have the possible situation existing here in the county in that we have two documents that are on public record. They have the same document number, same date of recording, same everything, except they're not the same page. We have a letter up there written by the sanitarian to George Corn with these deeds and sent to them, hit to Corn, saying, I guess this is okay, there's no problem here, and Corn writes back, written on it, it's upstairs. Absolutely fine. You, you guys talk on. The first one says clearly it's a warranty deed, a statement. The next one has an additional, uh, an additional phrase in it that's not on the original document. The microfish that was released to the public a year apart identifies only one document. But clearly, the public record has been tampered with. Um, the light's not the best. Oh yeah, there was a lawyer in Missoula. And here... You'll find out that one group of people were taken all the way to the Supreme Court to prevent them from doing what well, different another group of people were allowed to do and indeed had to have the cooperation of the county courthouse and county attorney. They facilitated for one group of people and another group of people that take all the way to the Supreme Court. So if you're part of the clique, if you're part of the power structure, you're able to make literally millions and other people are prevented from even getting their property subject. It depends on who you are, not what's right or wrong, not what the law is. It's simply a different set of rules if you are part of the team. But these were papers that were sent to the uh, county, uh, to the state uh, attorney general. Attorney general. There were precious state lines brought to bear. I don't know what it was. Newspapers won't touch it. Television stations, they won't touch it. County has been investigated by the state. They realize how deep and the big names that are involved. And they back off. Warranty deed after filing of deeds from landowner to itself. In other words, they sold land to themselves. It's no different than any other racketeering scheme. Over and over and over, we do the same things and we get away with it. Uh, there are protections in the, in, in the Constitution or in the laws 
I think it's called a RICO violation, where you just simply have to break the back of the structure that makes it work. But you got to have, you know, something like the untouchables or something to make it happen. People don't get to be millionaires these days that don't cheat. Normal people don't have a chance. There's a statement right here by Mr. Corn, the county attorney, that simply says, it's not an issue. It's not an issue for those people, but this other group of people, it was sure an issue to him for them because he took them all the way to the Supreme Court to show that you can't do it. What was that group? Rocky Mountain Timberlands, Inc. Uh, case number 93-539. I assume they lost? They did. And what actually happened was the ruling, it's on page six of the ruling, you can go to the internet and find it, it's right there. We affirm the holding of the district court that a landowner cannot divide a, sub, a large parcel of land into smaller parcels by executing the deed in which the grantor and the grantee are the same party. That's the ruling. It took Timberlands all the way to the Supreme Court and said if you have the same name as the first party and the second party, it's not a valid document. So it's not an issue for George, for Mr. Corn, because he's not the one being hurt. Well, he beat me for the office in uh, 90. George and I are friends. I think he does a good job. And he comes before the uh, legislature every once in a while. And I always introduce him as the guy that beat me many years ago and that I've been eternally grateful. So they say, well, you know, we don't trust George uh, because he's going to interpret it according to his political persuasion. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know. When our local government steps outside the, you know, the boundaries of what is described as legal um, pos uh, posturing, then we're, you know, then they become vulnerable to lawsuits. And so, you know, I don't blame them for trying to maintain, you know, their own sense of welfare to keep from to keep themselves out of court. The the arrogance is absolutely unbelievable. So you get to jump backward to make it legal. You know, I'd like to have that option on several occasions. <laughs> I'm sure we all do. I'm not involved with any I'm not involved with Timberlands. I've got nothing to do other than it's just wrong. Well, you know, this land is actually the, the pieces that are underneath the stock farm, farm which uh, Mr. Schwab is uh, a big investor in it. What is the best possible scenario and what do you think really will happen? Nothing. Because until you get somebody with the resources, the legal muscle, anyway, it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars to fight this. It's a drop in the bucket to their resources. Peace is more than the absence of conflict. It's the presence of justice. Well, there is none. The sheriff, the county attorney, the commissioners, I had to hear from that side, but to no avail. I guess we go to George, please. Oh uh, yeah, could you have a call Nico, please? I'm also police department. Oh, I guess we go to Nick Painter, please. Uh, what's the number? Uh, do you have caller ID for chance? <laughs> Detective Nick Painter is not available. He is not in today. He'll be in tomorrow. Would you like his voicemail? Record at the tone. Okay. One minute. Let me see if he's available, okay? Okay, thank you. Also recording. Either hang up or press one for more options. I'm the guy that's doing the, uh, the film documentary. Want to set up to do a documentary? An interview with him. An interview, okay. Yeah. Uh, can I speak with Sheriff Hoffman, please? Uh, I'm not sure if he's available. May I ask the call This is Nico. Hello, this is Sheriff Chris Hoffman. You reached my voicemail and that means I'm either on the other line or I'm away from my desk. I'm sorry, 
Robert, it does not appear that he is available at this time. I could hit transfer you to his voicemail. He can give you a call back. You get the music. Spando Ballet. I'd like to set up an appointment with him. Okay. Right, no, good. I'm, I'm not gonna be with you. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be part of it. It's getting all sides of all stories. Uh, I understand. I represented it not bad. I understand, but I'm. I'm not gonna do it. Okay. Right. Thank Thanks you. for the offer. Right. You right. This was getting to be too much. I needed a little R and R. what you're doing. I am slowly picking through a little pile of gravel a little bit of twinkly glass called sapphires. One of those tourist in Montana things that we all like. It's just great. It's kind of a strange little thing to actually talk about. <laughs> well, what did you do? Well, I, I peered at little rocks all day. However, there is a purpose to our madness. Look at this, see, there's a little piece of green glass that just springs out, and it's an actual tiny sapphire. Isn't that just cool? Right out of a bucket. Small, yet at the same time, little twinkly treasures. Yeah, apparently I've had too much coffee. Once you find one, you get a little, your heart beats a little faster, and you find another one, and then somebody next to you finds a big one, and then you really get fired up, and then you're hooked. It's just <laughs> Genuine sapphires from the Sapphire Mountains. You know, I've already got the start of a matching set of earrings. Welcome to Montana, Jim Mountain. Well, I think the biggest challenge for me here in Ravalli County is, as a sound engineer, is finding a gig that pays. My truck's on a tow-at-home basis. I don't drive it any farther than I can tow it back home again. There ain't much industry here. <laughs> here in this town, about the only industry you have is, is uh, they support the Rocky Mountain Lab. You know, that's it.
You can trace back the origins of Rocky Mountain Labs just slightly over 100 years ago to the appearance of Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the Bitterroot Valley. And ultimately, the cause for that was elucidated by an infectious disease physician from Chicago named Howard T. Ricketts. He determined that Rocky Mountain spotted fever was an infectious disease. They were able to transmit it to experimental animals and that it was carried by ticks. And Ricketts, while in Mexico City studying the typhus outbreak, caught typhus and died. But the people that he brought around him to study Rocky Mountain spotted fever then went on to carry on his work. And those folks ultimately ended up founding what, be, what is now known as Rocky Mountain Labs. Much of the yellow fever vaccine was produced right here in Hamilton, Montana. Dr. Willie Bergdorfer was looking at some samples from ticks which had been sent from Connecticut. Willie was an expert in diseases of ticks and what he would do is they would take these teeny tiny ticks, cut off their legs, put a drop of what was called hemolymph on a slide and look at them under a microscope. He there by identified the cause of Lyme disease right here in this very same building up on, the, up on the third floor. Three very important diseases, the etiology of them was not only discovered here at Rocky Mountain Labs, but the agents were named for scientists that were actually on the staff here. Dr. Ricketts, Dr. Bergdorfer, Dr. Hadlow, Dr. Cox, he worked on developing the first polio vaccines. I think the biggest fear here is like the lack of uh, concern. You know, when you have science who's only interested in science and not the safety of people, you know, I mean, that, that's what is really appalling here. They said that uh, uh, it's going to be a forced vaccination and that we're going to use the military to uh, enforce it. I would like for you to, I heard this on Fox News. Yep. 425 employees right now. About a third of those are uh, individuals with doctoral level degrees. Most of them live in Hamilton and probably within 10 or 15 miles. Well, I guess you couldn't pick a better place. I mean, because, uh, you know, there's only one way in, one way out, mountains on every side of it. So if something did happen, uh, the casualties would be minimal. <laughs> so I'd say you're wrong because there's two ways. There's actually three ways. You know, Highway 93 North, Highway 93 South, and, U and Montana Highway 83 or 38, which goes over Scalpaho Pass. You're an hour and a half away from the nearest help. And there's no concern that 40 miles away, would they be helicoptered in? Would they They're work here. Take the oh, they, okay. okay. They're on site. They're part of the Missoula Regional Hazmat Team, and they're dispatched by the uh, regional hazmat team out in Missoula. If there's an incident on site, they would respond on site. No facilities put in there for, for fire or hazmat or professionals brought in. Level A suits and all that stuff is, is right here on site. As of the present time, there's no fire station on the Rocky Mountain Labs campus. A couple of individuals in the community over the last year or so have raised this issue with the people at NIH who are responsible for fire response, the Office of Research Services. And those uh, queries have gone all the way up to the director of the Office of Research Services. The chief of the Hamilton Fire Department, the assistant chief, works here, and we have at least one, possibly more, Hamilton volunteer fire department uh, firemen who work here at Rocky Mountain Labs. You know, you're getting it shoved right down our throat here. I mean, it's like, uh, we're coming in, here's what we're going to do and you got to like it. In the case of the 20-year master plan, the NIH commissioned a full-blown environmental impact statement which, which analyzed all the potential impacts, including land acquisition. That is in the master plan and it's also in the environmental impact statement. One of the first things they did is they hired local cops to, um, that was who was going to guard it. Um, you would assume that with, with the stuff that's in there, um, that that would be, you know, a paramount thing that, you know, that could be a real bad thing if, if a terrorist or someone, you know, was to know that was there and wouldn't be hard to walk in there and do something, would it? Rocky Mountain Labs has a contingent of 12 fully licensed federal police officers. Uh, they work closely with local law enforcement, the sheriff department and the police department. They frequently get together, occasionally down here at Rocky Mountain Labs, occasionally at the police station or at the sheriff's department. When you, when you look at who's being probably 
uh, paid off here. You know, the, the county officials, the city officials. I called all the federal agencies I knew to call, and of course every one of them said, it's not my job, not my job. So basically, I sent it to the FBI. And uh, they did nothing except call me up and threaten me. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, what do you do? I'm just an old fireman, I don't know nothing. They treat me like a terrorist because I complained. I griped and I'm put on the watch list. You know, that's like, holy smokes, this guy's griping, he's gotta be bad. And that was my wake up call is how deep, how deep the, uh, shall we say, cover up goes. I mean, it's, it goes clear to uh, very high places. Well, you know, this is, uh, Rocky Mountain Labs has been in Hamilton, Montana, on this location for close to 100 years. Uh, it's a critical and important part of the community, and the vast majority of the citizenry and the local officials that I've come in contact with view Rocky Mountain Labs as an asset in their community. This is not what we want. I want the government out of my health. This is my body, and I don't want them telling me what I can and cannot do with it. A national spotlight was on Montana, from it being the forerunner for Guantanamo transfers to Obama's health care reform plan, which was engineered by Montana's own Senator Max Baucus. I went to the Senator's Missoula headquarters in the hopes of gathering more information. My name is Kathy McClure, and I am the Purple Bus Lady. I'm a health care activist. Because as everyone standing here today knows, Health care in our country is just flat unaffordable. Yes, we do have a historic opportunity to fix health care. Do you think Bacchus is just using lip service when he says he wants every single American covered? I think he's concerned with having a bipartisan consensus, and I understand his motivation for that politically. But the question is, are we really assessing reform from a a wholesale point of view of how best to really work on fixing our health care system. Senator Baucus controls hearings on this subject. He really has an opportunity to get the full story in front of the American public. I think he has an obligation to do that in a responsible way. And I think by leaving the single pay payer people, experts, out of this discussion, I think he made a significant error in judgment, which he's actually admitted to. Uh, but I would invite Senator Baucus to hop on my purple bus for a day or two. Back in Hamilton, the health care debate was just as heated, and Senator Baucus was in everyone's crosshairs. I'm the hospital CEO, and uh, Senator Baucus's office called the hospital and said, would you host and facilitate uh, this uh, forum for us? Uh, Max is so excited about taking... Well, Max wasn't there. And that didn't help. Senator Baucus did record a message, even though he couldn't be here today. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Max here. Uh, Health care reform is my number one priority. Um, it's why I sent my top staff out to hold these sessions. Our health care system is in a crisis. It affects every one of us, uh, from Hamilton to White Sulphur Springs, Shelby, Glasgow. Uh, people are literally going bankrupt because of overwhelming medical costs. I don't know. Uh, where Max's money comes from. If he was a d Republican in that position, a lot of people would want to give him money. Don't you think that compromises some of his politics? I'm sure there's some people like that. <laughs> I know, you know, but a lot of, uh, if you get a whole bunch of money from one particular uh, group or one particular group of people, um, subliminally it might work that way. But I don't know that anybody's ever Ever, anybody's ever shown that, that Max did something for receiving money. Anybody that got that job is going to get a lot of money.
sorry again, I can't be with you. All the very best. To, this is going to be a good session. Thank you. We want to create uh, some sort of a pool so that people can go in and pick from several different insurance plans that will all compete against each other, including a public plan option, to really keep an insurance companies' feet to the fire and make sure that they're offering competitive rates to, to consumers out there. That's good. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. It's embarrassing. We're too big to fail. It's our money. We want the change. We know everyone here today knows, and most people listening, if you have TV or radio, are covering this incredible event. Here the subject today. brought me out. I've been worried about it since early 1960s. When people were, a few of them were still screaming McCarthyism, using the fear, socialized medicine, to scare people off from it. That is so ridiculous. <laughs> they treat it like it's a bad word. And I also said to Max, you know this is right. That's all. Bacchus is not paying attention. He doesn't have his eye on the ball. We all know that he's getting way too much money from the insurance companies. If you think you're going to get health care, you know, slap yourself in the face a little bit. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. Because corporate America owns Max Bacchus. I, I guess what I'd really like to know is when you're going to run against Mr. Obacchus. <laughs> well, where were you a few years ago when I did and lost? When I say Bacchus doesn't have his eye on the ball, it's why isn't he paying attention to Montanans now, here, in this state? We don't want health care reform if you're going to do it without us. Because I've written to Max Bacchus before, and the only thing I get back is a form letter. Uh, Senator Bacchus and his colleagues have taken a very hard look at how health care is delivered in this country. And making he sure still didn't that answer that my question. Uh, He's not as bad as some of the Democrats, but I would much prefer a Republican uh, senator. We're being swift voted on the airwaves by the big money, and we're being talking head to death. And Max is ducking for cover. Of course he has responsibility for that. We have the responsibility to tell him that we, we voted in two Congresses in the last two election cycles to not listen to the K Street lawyers to not listen to the insurance industry and we expect him to listen to us now yes, 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 yes. and i do believe i should have the same insurance as senator box does yes. amen yes. Yes. Great insurance. Yes. 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 none of you have told us anything we don't all we already know how many people here want single payer no. 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 we have single payer now with the VA. How well does the VA work? Single payer will not work. I think, uh, I know Senator Fox is prepared to see it, and I know a lot of merits are still prepared. <laughs> the most powerful senator in the country who has a former employee who works in the White House, a girlfriend who works in the Justice Department, which is awful convenient if he gets uh, investigated by the FBI. Who's going to oppose Max Blockus? Well, that, that's a good question. You start, you started, I'll tell you. Yeah, you started off saying we don't want to make people get rid of them. That's right. Sure that they like them. Fine, let them keep them. If it takes until midnight, you should be here listening to every person. I, the only poll that matters is getting 60 votes to pass something. So get their whole panel up there first with an agenda, and then how much do they really get to hear from the audience? Pharmaceutical companies, it's about insurance companies. The roundtable discussion ended up being a presentation. That's kind of my wrap of the whole day. And in fact, I had a, about a one-minute conversation with him about a week and a half ago in the Capitol, and he basically told me that he, I asked him to put single pair on the table. He said, no, I'm not going to waste my time and money. And I said, well, maybe it's not your job. I want to lead into a couple of songs written by a couple of guys who are, who are called socialists. 
by Joe McCarthy. Who remembers Joe McCarthy? Do I have to explain? And nobody's singing any of Joe McCarthy's songs anymore. So don't let them tell you that single-payer socialism. It's BS.